helpful. We have been talking a lot about liberty. We've heard a lot about liberty and freedom. And thank God for the freedom uh, that Christ has afforded each and every one who places their faith in him. He's, there is no respecter of persons. Every single one who accepts Christ and enters into the new covenant has been set free from not just the penalty of sin, but also the power of sin. So freedom is truly ours. But with freedom comes responsibility. I said, with freedom comes responsibility. And uh, before you go home, I want to put a little bit of that responsibility into your heart and mind. Open your Bibles, please, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. We'll take our text, very well-known text. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. The Bible reads, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you were to step into my classroom across the road on the fourth floor of Jimmy Swaggart Bible College, there is a typed message that has been on the board now for about 25 years that each and every student that walks into that classroom will see, and it says this. The level of the believer's spiritual maturity can only rise as high as the believer's correct knowledge of the cross of Christ. I want to say that again to you. The level of the believer's spiritual maturity can only rise as high as the believer's correct knowledge of the cross of Christ. Now, Brother Swigert and I argue every now and then about the timing of this. Was it late 96, early 97? Absolutely. <laughs> but if that's so, then we have been ministering the word of the cross, the teaching of the cross, for nearly, listen now, 27 years. <laughs> Closing in on year 27. And one of the things that Brother Swigert has made clear as we study the message of the cross, as we come better acquainted with it after all this time, because you learn as you go and you learn as you grow, he said this, he said, there's no graduating class from the message of the cross. The message of the cross is not a fad that you learn and then you lay aside. It's not just a theology, ladies and gentlemen, even though it is theology. It's not just a portion of Scripture, even though it is a portion of Scripture. The message of the cross is the meaning of the new covenant. We live today in the new covenant. And so this message that we've been learning and this message that we've been proclaiming has been building and teaching and learning and guiding us all these years. 
And one of the things that I think it was J. Vernon McGee said it uh, in a message about Abraham, he said this, that in result of your relationship with Christ, this ties in with the message of the cross, he said, all hope of the flesh has to die. You can't live for Christ and not understand that there's some things in you and I that need to be changed. I don't stand here as someone before you that has been totally perfected. I am on a journey. And the message of the cross has uh, given me the uh, opportunity to be changed. But I'm here to tell you that if we will allow the Lord to delve into our hearts and take out of the things that no, don't need to be there, put into us the things that we need, then God's, listen, God's highest potential and every one of you, no matter what your age is here tonight, every one of you has a high watermark that God intends for you to find. He's got a high watermark for your life. He's got a high watermark for your ministry. He's got a high watermark, the high level that you could attain to, but you're going to have to understand and not only understand and apply uh, the message of the cross to your life. It's more than a theology. It's more than just a mantra. It's more than a bumper sticker. It's a way of life. And tonight I want to help a little bit in the process of bringing this message home by preaching to you a message simply in, entitled, Developing the Mind of Christ. Developing the Mind of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these that are here they have come attentive to your word, and we pray, Lord, that you would guide us now, you would lead us. Let the Holy Spirit come, the one that makes teaching and preaching easy. And Father, let what is being said be open to the heart and mind by that same Spirit. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. The message of the cross is something that you must understand in order to develop properly as a Christian. There's no bones about it. I don't back up from saying that. Everything that you've heard this week has been a portion of the gospel. It has been truth that has been imported to your heart and your spirit by the moving and operation of the spirit, the ability of God to heal, the ability of God to bless, the ability of Jesus to baptize us with the Holy Spirit, the ability of Christ to set us free and freed again from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. But there is a responsibility for those of us that are in Christ, those of us that are in the new covenant, those of us that are learning the message of the cross. After 25 years, we ought to look a little bit more like Jesus. I'm here to tell you that the most important, go ahead, give the Lord a hand clap. If we truly understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, we're not going to be remaining the same. It's an impossibility. He will be changing us, and there will be earmarks, identifying marks in our walk with God that are exhibited in our life throughout the way that we deal with people, throughout the way that we deal with circumstances. All of these are evidence as to whether or not we're truly Truly believers who understand how God wants to operate in our hearts and in our lives. And part of this process that we find that is so necessary uh, is exhibited here in Philippians 2. But before I get there, let me just say some things that I covered this uh, this week over in the classroom sessions earlier in the, in the over across the way, and I, I don't apologize for repeating some of the things I'm about to say. But the new covenant process is always a process of grace and faith. 
The old covenant was a covenant of works. This is a covenant of faith. Thereby, we are operating in faith, operating by faith. Our key responsibility as new covenant believers is to place our faith in the provision that God has provided and then to freely receive, listen, freely receive what God has in store for us as a result of our properly placed faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 still show me the greatest overview of the new covenant that we have. For by grace are you saved by... Oh, I wish I had some Bible students here. By... By... The just shall live... There you are. The new covenant then is all about grace and faith. God doesn't operate from a labor for reward mentality. In other words, we don't work to get God's blessing, even though there's work involved in being blessed. We don't labor for freedom from sin, even though we might labor in the battle of the fight of faith. There is a process in the new covenant that must be dominated by faith and grace. If we're going to be saved. And again, the Greek word uh, from saved translated as sozo. It means to be healed, to be protected, to be delivered, to be made whole. So if we need to be healed, if we need to be protected, if we need to be delivered, if we need to be made whole, the process of God is always by grace through faith. Now, you can be a grace and faith guy and still not understand the message of the cross because those are terms that are somewhat ambiguous. They can slide right by, so let me be a little more specific here. Faith must be centered in Christ and his redemptive act. Your faith has to rest upon Christ, upon Jesus, upon Jesus. I'm going to drop a name on you, upon Jesus. Jesus. There is no salvation given under heaven by any other name. His name is Jesus. He's the Son of God who loved you and came to this planet in the form of humanity to lay down his life to redeem us and give us the freedom we've been shouting about, give us the freedom we've been saying amen to. So our faith must rest Always, again, the processes of God in the new covenant are grace and faith. And faith has to be specifically, consistently, day after day, hour after hour, in Jesus and what he has done for us at Calvary. And then God has designed the new covenant whereby grace becomes a reality. Not an, an ambiguous grace again. This grace is, especially in Pauline teaching, is the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. Listen, the direct help of the Holy Spirit will come to the believer who keeps their faith centered in Christ and what he has done. As a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit moves inside of you immediately and begins to process the benefits of Calvary into your heart and into your life. This is not the baptism with the Holy Spirit, as Paris preached. That's for service. This is for being conformed into the image of Christ. And the moment you say yes to Jesus, listen, and, and let's get this clear. We are a Pentecostal group. But Pentecost will die if they don't understand the foundation of the work of the Spirit relative to salvation. And we've got to be sure that we understand that the moment the believing sinner comes to Christ, he is crucified with him, buried with him, raised up with him to live in him from a brand new source of power. And that source of power is one aspect of the grace of God, the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Holy Spirit is there to do one thing, and that is to glorify Christ in you. And when you rest in him, your eyes are upon him, not in you, not in what you do, not in your performance, not in your laws, not in your rituals, 
but your faith is in him and what he's done for you, the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ by going to work on your behalf and conforming you into the image of Christ, meeting the need that you have in your life because your faith is not in yourself. It's in Christ. So when faith is properly centered in Christ and what he's done in grace is properly flowing, then the power of God ought to be changing us into the image of Christ. Again, that's why I brought up 25 years we've been teaching this, 27 perhaps, but 25 years with a pretty good grasp on where it all started and where it was going. So after 25 years, we ought to... We ought to, we ought to look a whole lot like Jesus, or at least more than we did 25 years ago. This message is not a message, again, that is to form a clique or a cliche that says we preach the cross. This is the life-changing, powerful message of the new covenant available to every single believer who will believe and place their faith in Jesus. And it is our desire and my desire, and I know Brother Swigert's and the rest of the team here, to make sure that the entirety of the body of Christ hears what we have to say. Now, what I did was just challenge you because there are some of you here that never have heard these processes of faith and grace. You've never heard about the initial responsibility that you have to keep your eyes in Christ, so you're brand new. And I wouldn't expect you to be able to do as or go as far along in this message as some of you that have been listening for 15 years. Okay, daddy's coming to town. We're going to have a test. Your growth in Christ is your daily examination. And one of the problems that Paul has with Philippi And there are not many. But any time that you read a book of the Bible or you're reading a certain text, you always want to overview the text. You want to see why Paul wrote what he wrote. And so oftentimes we come to this text and we say, oh, this is the theological kenosis of Christ, the self-emptying of Christ. Well, why did Christ, why why was it written? Paul didn't just all of a sudden be led by the Holy Spirit to uh, arrive at this need to tell us about the self-emptying of Christ. There was a, a purpose in it. And when we travel through the purpose and we find the purpose, we'll find some of our responsibility that I'm looking for out of the maturing believers who have heard the message of the cross. Yeah. So uh, I'm looking for this to be in you. Paul uh, loved the church at Philippi. The church at Philippi was one of his favorite churches. He was very, very at ease with them. You can tell that by his letter. Uh, He's very, very clear with them. He trusts them intently. After a period of time, they were finally able to send more uh, help for him while he was in jail in Rome, and he was so grateful. But he wrote the letter not just to say thank you, but to deal with several issues that were going on in the Philippian church. Now, this is 10 years after Paul was there. I need you to understand that Philippians 1 and 6 applies to the church at Philippi, but not necessarily to every believer. Watch what he said. Paul said, I'm confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Why was Paul confident. You got to answer the question because this church understood how to operate in the new covenant and for 10 years the evidence of God in them, changing them, right object of faith, right movement forward had been ongoing and Paul had been able, even if he wasn't with them, to witness the fact that they were growing. That's why I say to you tonight, those of you that are a part of SBN and part of this church and part 
part of this outreach, if you're a part of SBN, then I'm believing that you have the tools that you need to keep letting the Lord work in you. Not everybody in the church, and I'm sad to say it, it's not a holier-than-thou preaching down to people thing. It's the truth. Not everybody could receive this word from Paul. He wasn't confident in every church. So you need to be careful about saying, well, I'm confident that the Lord will work in me. He won't work in you if you're not operating by new covenant principle. He won't violate his word in any way, shape, fashion, or form. To the church in the Galatian region, he wrote, I fear for you because you're operating now under laws and rules and routines and not staying with the truth of faith and grace and the new covenant. I fear for you until Christ be formed in you again. So here's this church at Philippi. They're growing. Paul is confident in them. He planted the church. He taught them the truth. He corresponded with them. They've been connected with him all this time. And 10 years into it, he's confident in this church. But even though he's confident in this church throughout the scope of the epistle, there's some problems. Church fights. You were shouting a minute ago. (laughs) The Bible tells us that God sets the solitary in families. The psalmist said it. I don't think he's meant us to be out there on our own by ourselves. And I understand if SBN is uh, your church, I get that. I'm not disregarding that. But I can tell you that the best way to maneuver or provide yourself with an opportunity for growth is go sit with some other church folk. You're going to find how much grace you really need and how much you can receive when you get to know the rest of the body of Christ. You're going to find out the people that you don't like. You're going to find out the people that you do like. You're going to find out people that you uh, get along with and people you don't get along with. You're going to find people of varying degrees of intelligence and some and others that were, you know, with gifts and some not so many. It's a conglomeration of people from around the planet that God puts together in a unit and in a group. And it's here in this unit and in this group that the new commandment of the new covenant has to be carried out. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you are my disciples. See, when we are not allowing the growth process to impact us, when we come together, then it's church split after church split after church split after church split. Why? Because we're not we're not connecting with the help that this message can bring. Not to every degree that we need to. I didn't come to scold you. I just want you to think about the relationships you have with the people in your church. I want you to see, every one of us has been placed somewhere where we can be an effective tool in the plan of God. We are placed. God sets the solitary in families. But in this group in particular, the evidence of a little bit of rift is found in verses 21, 27 through 30, and he says, I need you to be unified. And in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, you need to be like-minded, have the same love in one accord, one mind. Don't strive. Don't pursue for vain glory. You must esteem others better than yourself. And you need to put other people's needs in front of yours. Welcome 
to responsibility. Now, the truth is, <laughs> we don't want to do that. That's not normal for us as human beings. Because as a result of the fall, one of the things that was evidenced was selfishness. Life is all about me, don't you know? It's me. Me. Not you. Me. I'm the most important thing in our church. I'm the most important thing in our ministry. If they would just let me do what I'm equipped to do. And sadly, sometimes there are people with true equipment that are needed in the body of Christ, but because they haven't applied the message of the cross to the responsibility of developing the mind of Christ, the work that could be done for Christ is not accomplished. Because it's all about me. I, I, I should be singing. Never mind if they shot singers, you'd live forever. I'm the one that should be preaching. I'm the one that should be. They should recognize me. All of that is remnants of the fall still existing in our hearts, and things need to change. There was battles going on in the Philippian church. I won't take you there, but you could read in chapter 4 where two female leaders of the church are arguing and Paul is pleading with them, you need to fix this. So watch, I'm taking too long here. But the whole premise is, here's a church that is maturing. Paul's confident in their growth, but yet in this area, they need to grow up. They need to move forward in the things of God. They need to become more effective in the plan of God. They need to become more effective as individuals and more effective as units in the body of Christ because God puts us together and places us together right where he wants us, but if we don't grow the way that we're supposed to, then we'll never find that formation of people and ministries that fit together to do the work of God because we're all focused on our own thing. We're all focused about me. We're all focused about where I stand and my role. Amen, Brother Larson. Preach it, brother. Teach it. So to a good church who knows the message of the cross, Paul says, let this mind be in you. It's an attitude. It's a new thought process that needs to be added to those of us that know the message of the cross because I guarantee you, you're not going to be able to accomplish this outside of faith and grace. You know, I can teach you the message of the cross in six words. Lord, I can't. You can. Help! Lord, I can't. You can. Help! Yeah, and that's simplified. But that's telling the Lord, I can't be what you're asking me to be outside of the grace of God coming into my heart and coming into my life and changing me into what you want me to become. Let this mind be existing in you. Do, you. do you get it? This is an attitude. This is a thought process. This is an understanding. This should be something we seek and strive for. Let this mind. Philippians who aren't getting along, who are destroying the work of God because you're the big I and everyone else is the little you. Hear this. Let this. Now do you see why he wrote it? You see why he put it in there? Because he was going to give the greatest example of someone who did exactly what he's asking you to do. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. As we travel through what 
is going to be descriptive of the mind of Christ, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is that me? Is that how I think? Is that how I view my place in our church, in my ministry, and what God has given me to do? He said this, the mind of Christ, speaking of Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, if you want a good theological fight, this is the passage you're to study, but I'm going to simplify it for you and just simply say that Christ didn't place his position in heaven above the needs of other people. It was not so important for him to maintain his position of deity, which he always was, which he always maintained, which he had always had as creator. It wasn't so important for him that he maintained his position that he couldn't release it and come down to this planet and become one of us. What is so important to you that you won't release it to become a part of what God wants you to become a part of? And listen, Jesus never released his possession of being God, but he laid it aside for the betterment of someone else. He laid it aside for the betterment of you and I. We're shouting freedom. We're shouting hallelujah. We're shouting freedom from sin, etc., because of what Jesus did for us. He was willing to let go of a position above the needs, uh, or at least of his own design and desire, and he didn't feel the need to fight for this position, listen now, because he knew that whatever God wanted him to be and become, there was no man that would ever stop that from happening if he would just do what God asked him to do. See, sometimes we don't want to release things because we think, well, I'll never get to, I'll never be, uh, I've got to hold on to this because, no, you're, you're holding on to something that you're supposed to release and you're failing to trust that God is the one who can exalt you and place you wherever it is that you need to be. Do you understand in the plan of God that men don't control those things? You can politicize all you want to, get to know all the big wigs in the world, and all you'll have is a political position. But if you will allow your Savior the liberty to cause you to release your position that you thought you deserved for the will of God to be completed, there is no, listen, there is no person on the planet that can stop God from bringing you to the highest potential that he has designed for you. We don't see that. We're just so in and into ourselves and into us. But he was willing, Christ, here's the mind of Christ. He was willing to let go of his position, one that he had. Secondly, he made himself of no reputation. This is where we get the idea of he emptied himself, or the kenosis of Christ is the term. It means he emptied what he was, and he just yielded to what God was and what God wanted. No reputation. Man, that's not us. How do I know? I've seen your posts. (laughs) We make a post on media. Why? So that everybody will know who we are, what we do, what we look like, what we think, what we believe. You need to know about me. And man, we're in tall cotton if we get 50 likes or 25 tweets. And then somebody gets 26 tweets and we go, oh. 
Because we don't want to be unknown. See, there's that part of you that Christ still needs to change. I got I to gotta tell a story, because you're not the only ones. We're all in this process. I, <laughs> I remember my first year of being a Christian, I was involved in a church. God planted me in a beautiful little church up in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, got saved in Hermitage and found the church in Mount Juliet in Tennessee and was there for a year and a half and then in 1987 decided I was going to come down here for Bible college, felt that was the will of God to Jimmy Swaggart Bible College. So I applied and was accepted. One of my roommates at the time was getting married and his church originally was down in New Orleans and so uh, I went down with him. I'd been accepted by the school, and I thought, well, here's an opportunity to be in my friend's wedding. At the same time, take a look at the school. I can tell you the minute I marched onto these grounds, I knew this was where God wanted me. There was no doubt about it. Some of you are going to make that decision because of that very thing already in the next few days. But I went down to New Orleans to the church, and my first job in the church was a piano player. After losing my fingers, I retrained myself to play the piano and, and led worship in our church in Mount Juliet. And the pastor down in New Orleans told me, he said, when he, I went down with my friend who got married, and he said, well, why don't you do this? You're going to come to Bible college. Why don't you just come on down to my church? I'll pay you uh, and give you a place to live, and you'll be in my church. You'll be my worship leader, and you can drive back and forth to Brother Swigert's for school. Sounds perfect, doesn't it? And that's why I said, well, amen, praise God. There we go. I'll just, I'll just step right into it. And so that went along fine until about a week before I was supposed to leave and come down to go to school here and start working in that other church. And I'm sitting at the edge of my bed, and I'll never forget it, in my room in Baton Rouge in my house. And the Lord said to me very plainly, he said, set your face for Baton Rouge. What you talking about? (laughs) I got this all set up. This is perfect. You know, in my mind, I know we don't argue with God, but... But you know, and I hate this, but I have to admit it because it's such a great sermon illustration in this conversation. The first words out of my mouth, Oh, Lord, you just want me to go where nobody knows who I am. It literally came out of my mouth. You just want me to go where, see, reputation. Worried about what people think about us. The minute it came out of my mouth, I saw it. I said, oh, God, I'm sorry. And I called the pastor and said, I can't. I I, I can't. I can't even tell you why I can't. I just can't. I've got to set my face for Baton Rouge. Now, that was over 35 years ago. And two of the reasons that God said, set your face for Baton Rouge, were singing on this platform last night. See, you don't ever know what God has for you. And if you hold fast to that, oh, I've got to be this and they need to see me do that. This is what the message of the cross can help us eliminate. Took upon himself, I've got to hurry, took upon himself the form of a servant. This is the word bond slave. And a bond slave was a person that was indentured and had to work off a debt. But at the end of his time as a servant, if he wanted to stay with his boss, he could simply say, listen, I just love, I just love 
my master so much, I don't want to leave. I don't want to go back to trying to do my own thing. I, I'll just stay here. So for love of his master, desiring to just do the will of his master, he would stay where he was. But there was another reason why a servant might forever stay a servant, and that was sometimes when he came in single, he would meet another servant, they would get married and have children. But if he left after his indentureship was accomplished, they didn't. They couldn't leave with him. They belonged to the master. So there were two reasons why people become or became a bond slave. Number one was for love of the master, and number two was for love of other people. Jesus became a bond slave, desiring only to fulfill the will of God and for love of you and me. Knowing that if he was willing to sacrifice himself and accomplish the will of God, that you and I would be here tonight talking about who he was and what he had done. And the freedoms that you have, and multiple millions of people around the world, the freedoms that they have, could be accomplished by what he would do for us at Calvary. Let this mind be in you. Not positioning yourself for a grandiose platform or to be of reputation, but because you want to do the will of God, because you want to do something that will impact somebody else. See, this is what the message of the cross is supposed to provide, and he is found humbled, and i got to hurry, obedient even to the death of of the cross. Is that your mind? Is that how you look at your life in Christ and your ministry and your purpose? Is that your mindset? Or are we still pushing and arguing and fighting about who we are and how important we are? And does most of our thoughts about ministry and work simply delve in how badly someone else does the job and if they'd only get me, then they'd be? Paul said, don't push for vainglory. Don't strive. Don't fight with each other. But let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Singers, musicians, come back. Are you getting what growth produces? Or am I, I don't think I'm saying it very well, but if we find ourselves just wanting this and berating other people that we're working with and berating other members of the ministry that we're in, berating each other and, and, and trying to fight each other and overwhelm each other and take everybody's position because I'm the one. We're not growing in the message of the cross. We're not growing in the processes of grace and faith. Let this mind be in you. And developing the mind of Christ is going to take, can I say it? It's going to take you humbling yourself to death to self. You want the will of God, all hope of the flesh is going to have to die. But I'm here to tell you that if you'll begin to trust God and you'll begin to live for God and you'll begin to operate by faith and grace, 
the power of God's Spirit will guide you. You'll start loving the people that God has placed you with instead of fighting with them. You'll be acting like he did, not like you used to. Out of a love for God. And you won't have to fake it till you make it. Until you make it, I'd really encourage you to fake it, but <laughs> the message of the cross will put a love for the people that you're working with in your heart, and it's a sign of maturity, lack of jealousy, envy, strife, pushing back and forth, destroying the work of God. What do you think the world looks at thinks when it looks at the church and sees that going on with us. They look at us and they say, why should I want to be a part of that system? I already got that system. So while we preach the message of the cross, I want to see people, myself at the front of the line, develop so that when things happen, we won't respond, oh, you just want to put me somewhere no one knows me. <laughs> if you relinquish what gifts you really have to the will of power of God, there's no telling where God will place you. There's no telling what God will be able to do with you. And you won't need a political system. Because the Bible teaches us that God is the one who exalts. God is the one. Listen. It says in 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, at the appointed time. You let God form you into what he wants you to become, and you'll be walking through this earth in correct relationship with the people around you, and you will be thinking, I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up, but it's going to be good. I have great expectations for what God wants to do for my life and my ministry, but I've learned to be content with what he's given me. I'm totally happy doing what I do. It's full of joy. That means that there's no limit to what God can do when a person will take on the mind of Christ. And it'll take grace and faith to remove the aspects of self and flesh that are still in us. Would you stand with me? Speaking of Christ, God also hath highly exalted him above every name. There it is. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men can be saved and changed, all because of who he is and what he's done. And if you want to impact your world, those close to you, those in your family, those in your church, then you're going to have to develop a mindset that looks just like the mindset Christ had. Don't let the devil win in the church. Don't let the devil destroy us. You have something in your heart, Brian?
declaration of faith say Lord take my heart and form it you just heard ladies and gentlemen is what every Christian needs to know not just hear but know and understand how to grow how to walk in faith continuously we want to leave you with this before we dismiss tonight some of you may ask the question how do we place our faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us by understanding that everything that you received from God was paid for by Jesus Christ. Through what he did at Calvary, everything comes through Christ and what he did at Calvary. Turn around, tell your neighbor you love him. Be back with us in the morning at 10 a.m. You don't want to miss it. We love you. God bless you.